ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد I welcome all of you to this uh, class. This is the sixth class. Uh, we're still reading from the book Tafsir al Nasik bi Ahkami al Manasik of our beloved Shaykh al Allama Abdul Muhsin bin Hamad al Abad al Badr, Hafidahullah, about the Hajj. In the previous class, we learned the pillars of Hajj and Umrah. Umrah and Hajj has pillars. Umrah has three, and the same three are pillars for Hajj as well, with an extra fourth one for the Hajj. Tonight, we go ahead and read the Wajibatu al Hajj wal Umrah. Of course, now we're reading from this book, so we have a lot of classes. We're going to have a lot of classes, but we're going to try our best to finish this book inshallah at least before the people those who are going for hajj leave for hajj because the people they're going to start leaving soon in a couple of weeks and we may even have to do this more than just these days that we're doing it on wednesday and saturday so we can finish it and in the end once we finish this book we're gonna i'm gonna give you a summary we're gonna have one class on a summary of hajj what to do from A to Z, inshallah, from one of the summarized, you know, version of how to perform Hajj according to the book and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We're gonna do that in the end once we complete this this book. Why this book is long? Because the Shaykh he brings details, and we need this. Alhamdulillah, he brings adilla, proofs, and the like. But inshallah, ta'ala, I mention this so that you remind me. Once I say, well, alhamdulillah, we finished this book, then remind me, say, brother, please, he says that the next class is going to be on summary on, on Hajj. So that you will be only on one class for some people who want just to know what to do, that's what it is. But if the people, they want details as a study classes, there, these classes are for, inshallah. Qala Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, Habidahullah. واجبات الحج والعمرة هي التي يجب الاتيان بها وإن لم يؤت بها جبرت بدم لا يأكل منه من وجب عليه ويطعم ويطعم لفقراء الحرم. First of all, the Sheikh tells us what is this واجبات الحج, the obligatory elements. They are in a lesser degree than the than the pillars, but they are very important as well. Okay. This واجبات of حج وعمرة a person, the Muslim, should act upon them as well. Should fulfill them, should know what they are, and should act upon them. However, if a person doesn't, do, doesn't perform any of them, then they should slaughter an animal. They should slaughter an animal, and that person does not eat from it. That's the expiation for not fulfilling one of the obligatory elements that a person will slaughter an animal and so that the people, the poor of Mecca, will eat from it. For the poor of Mecca, not for anybody else. وذلك لقول ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما من نسي من نسكه شيئا أو تركه فليهرق دما Ibn Abbas said, whoever forget any rights from the obligatory elements or did not act upon it, should slaughter an animal. Should slaughter an animal. It's collected by Imam Malik in Al-Muwatta and with the Isnad Sahih, with the chain of narration that is sound. قال الشيخ حفظه الله والواجبات في العمر اثنان وفي الحج سبعة. Now the sheikh is giving both now حج and عمرة. 
there is two obligatory elements in, in Umrah and there is seven in Hajj. So remember, the pillars of Umrah, they were three. The obligatory elements, the wajibat, two. Hajj has four pillars, but he has seven obligatory elements, wajibats. بدأ الشيخ بالحج قال الأول الإحرام من الميقات that the ihram as the first one الإحرام من الميقات any person who is going to make umrah or hajj their intention starts at the miqat that's when they say لبيك اللهم umrah or لبيك اللهم حجا and by the way, this is not the, the intention. Because it is not permissible to say the intention loudly. That's a bid'ah, that's an innovation. Because the, the intention is an action of the heart. Somebody may say, but well, isn't that saying la bayk Allahumma hajj? Saying intention? No, that's just to uh, mention what you're about to do, umrah or hajj. But it's not permissible, the ulama, they say it's not permissible for someone to say, Nawaitul Umrah. It's not permissible for someone to say, I intend to perform Umrah. I intend to perform Hajj with verbally. No, it's in the heart. So the Ihram should be from the Miqat. And we mentioned to you the Miqat is a specific place. Places, actually there's five of them. We're going to learn them later on. That... Uh, assigned by the Prophet Sallallahu anyone who wants to perform Umrah or Hajj they should not pass them without engaging in a state of Ihram لأن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم بيّن المواقيت وقال هن لهن ولكل آت أتى عليهن من غيرهم ممن أراد الحج والعمرة فمن كان دو ذلك فمن كان دون ذلك فمن حيث أنشأ حتى أهل مكة من مكة رواه البخار المسلم عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما he mentioned because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has made clear these places where the Muslim uh, get engaged in a state of ihram. He says these are the places where the people engage in a state of ihram and also for the people that live in the area and whoever come through them. Okay? And whoever come through them. i give you an example. Uh, the people of Medina, they, they engage in a state of ihram from the place called Dhul Hulayfa. Now it is called Abiyar Ali, the wells of Ali. Abiyar Ali now, that's the name they have it. But the real name of the Sunnah name is Dhul Hulayfa. Anybody who lives in Medina and in that area, they want to make Umrah, they, once they reach, they drive in or walk in. Once they reach the Hulayfa, they, at that moment, they say, Labbaik Allahumma Umrah. They don't say it at their home. The ulama, they says, yes, they can take a shower, prepare themselves, put the clothing of ihram at home if they want to. But they should not say, Labbaik Allahumma Umrah at home. Because now they have to wait until they reach these places. As for the people who live between Mecca and these places, see, they live between. They live after. So these people, if they want to make a Umrah, since they live between the Miqat and the Haram, they make their intention from their homes. They don't have to, to walk to drive back to the, these places. Okay? No, they do it from their homes. Even the people of Mecca. For Hajj. For Hajj, the people of Mecca, on the 8th of the Hijjah, they make their intention from Mecca. As for the Umrah, the ulama, they says that they will go out to the hill and then come back for Umrah, inshallah. فمن مر بالمواقيت مريدا الحج أو العمرة سواء كان من أهل تلك المواقيت أو من غيرهم وجب عليه الإحرام منها. 
So anyone who passes by these places that are signed by the Prophet ﷺ, they are like different. For the north people who come from Sham and others, they have a place. People who come from the west, Europe, Egypt, North Africa, America, and the like, they have a place called al Juhfa. The people of Yemen, they have Yelemlem. Yemen, and whoever come through Yemen, from the south, Sudan, Somal, Ethiopia, and, and the like, those people of South Africa, and the like, they go through, through once they, they arrive to this one. Likewise, the people are coming from the Iraq. They have Karnul Manazil. The others, they have that Irq. So there's five of them. Okay, so the Sheikh says, anyone who's going to Mecca, intending Hajj or Umrah, because other people, they go, they don't, they have business, they live there, okay? But if someone going to Mecca for Umrah or Hajj, once they pass by any of these mawaqit, these places, they should engage in a state of ihram. It become obligatory upon them to engage in a state of ihram from those places. الثاني الحلق أو التقصير عند الإحلال من الحج والعمرة. The second from the wajibat, the obligatory elements, is shaving the whole head or three minutes, not just a part of it. The whole hair, the head has to be trimmed or shaving it. When you do this, to come out of the state of ihram, whether in from umra. When you finish the Umrah, this happens when you finish the Umrah. This is the last thing you do. Or in Hajj. We will learn later on when you do that, inshallah ta'ala. Because of the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Fatih, verse 27, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَ بِالْحَقِّ لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُوسَكُمْ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ لَا تَخَافُونَ for certainly you will enter the Masjid al-Haram, insha'Allah, amineen, secure, no fighting. Muhalliqina ru'usakum, shaving your head, your heads, or trimming them. And you will not fear. وَلِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فِي سورة الْبَقَرَة verse 196 وَلَا تَحْلِقُوا رُؤُسَكُمْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ الْهَدْيُ مَحِلَّهِ And do not shave your heads until... The hadi, that slaughter animals that you take with you, is about to be sacrificed. And this is pertaining to the Eid. Not the Udhiyah of the Eid, but on the Eid, Yom Al-Nahr, because that's when you shave your head in Hajj. Okay? Uh, on the eighth of the Hijjah, you go to Mina. The Hujjah, they go to Mina. And they stay there in Mina. The ninth of the Hijjah, they go to Arafat. They stay there until Maghrib. They don't pray Maghrib. Then they come back to Muzdalifa. That's when they pray Maghrib and Isha. And they spend the night in Muzdalifa until they pray Fajr. Except for the weak people and the elderly and those who have valid excuse, they can leave early. Okay, after the middle of the night. And then <coughs> that day, which is the 10th of the Hijjah, which is the Yom al Nahr. That's when the, it's a eight day everywhere, okay? That's the day when the people, they come and they throw the jamara, jamarat al-aqaba. There is three jamarat, but only one. And then they slaughter their animal, and they shave. They do not shave in Arafah, Muzdalifah, okay? That's what it means. ولقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر للمحلقين قالوا يا رسول الله وللمقصرين قال اللهم اغفر للمحلقين قالوا يا رسول الله وللمقصرين قال اللهم اغفر للمحلقين قالوا يا رسول الله وللمقصرين قال وللمقصرين رواه البخاري ومسلم عن ابي هريره رضي الله عنه and also he mentioned this hadith that is collected by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim on the authority of Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he made dua he says, Oh Allah, forgive those who shave their heads. They said, Oh Messenger of Allah, and those who trim it too. Because some people, they trim their heads, they didn't shave. 
Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said again, O oh Allah, forgive those who shave their heads. They said, O oh Messenger of Allah, and those who trim their heads too. For the third time, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, O oh Allah, forgive those who shave their heads. They said, O oh Messenger of Allah, and those who trim too. He says, and those who trim too. Allah Akbar. From here the ulama, they says that shaving the head is better. And some people they cannot like, they don't want to lose their pretty hair. And they, they, they will like, they, some of them they don't do it like the women, they go like here. No, you have to trim, you have to take them, the, the, what do you call it? Clippers. The clippers and trim the whole thing. Some people they don't want to do that, I don't know why. Allah almost time. Shaving it is better. If a piece people don't shave the head and they trim it, it's okay. But the Prophet ﷺ make dua three times for those who shave their heads. The only time that the ulama they says you don't shave and it's better for you to trim, it's when you come, for example, to make hajj. But you want to make tamattu' because when you make tamattu' you have to complete the umrah. Once you make it to, to, to the haram, you make tawaf, you pray two rak'at, you make sa'i between Safa and Marwa, and you shave. Now your umrah is over, and you wait until the 8th of the hijjah and start hajj. But on the 10th, you have to shave again. So the ulama, they says, if somebody perform this umrah, and they arrive in Mecca, and they have time so that if they shave, the hair will grow again so that they can have some hair to shave on the tenth. It's better for them to shave. But if somebody get there on the sixth, on the fourth, on the fifth of the hijjah, and they shave, and then on Yom or uh, tenth they have nothing, they said those, be- those people is better for them to trim it down, to cut it down, and they will shave it inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip on the tenth of the hijjah. قال الشيخ حفظه الله والإحرام من الميقات والحلق أو التقصير واجبان في الحج والعمرة. Now what he mentioned now, إحرام from the miqat from that place that is assigned by the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And once again when we say إحرام it's not like the clothing of إحرام. You can wear your clothing of إحرام in your house. Let's say somebody right here from Georgia, from Atlanta, making حج. And they going straight to Mecca. Let's say somebody is going tomorrow for Hajj. You can. And they going straight from a plane from here to New York. New York to Jeddah. And from Jeddah, they take a bus or a... There is no plane from Jeddah to Mecca by the way. Alright? So this person, yes, they can, if they want to, if they choose to, they can put on the clothing of Ihram, those white clothing, right here in Atlanta, Georgia, no problem. They can wash up, take a shower, put some colognes on, alhamdulillah, put those, and get on the, get on the uh, Hartsville, Atlanta, get on the plane. Of course, people are going to look at him, people are going to look at you anyway. So don't pay no mind. And he gonna go to New York and get on another flight to Jeddah and from Jeddah, it's okay. But he cannot say la bayk Allahumma umrah here in Georgia. That person cannot say la bayk Allahumma umrah in New York. Can he say it in Jeddah? No. No, he cannot say it in Jeddah. Where he say it? In Mecca. Where? Miqat. Ahsant. See, that's a good answer I'm looking for. In the Miqat. He don't say it. Is Atlanta the Miqat? No, it's not. Because the Prophet didn't tell us that. Is New York Miqat? No, it's not. Is Jeddah Miqat? Depend. Is Miqat for who? The people of Jeddah. As for us, we have to engage in the state of Ihram before the plane gets in Jeddah. But the Miqat is a place on earth. So how? Is the plane stopped there? Doesn't stop. So you need to know. 
You need to know where the miqat, when the plane. Alhamdulillah, now uh, the people, the, 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 what do you call them? The people are working in the plane? And not travel agencies. Travel agencies give you tickets. Stewards and flight at attendants. Okay, the flight attendants. He or she, alhamdulillah, now they, they say, especially if you go with Muslim ones, because some people they go with non-Muslims. That's how, that's the only thing they got. They go with Lufthansa, Air France. And they go from here to Paris or Frankfurt. And then from there to Jeddah. But now, alhamdulillah, if you, if you, if you, if you go with the Saudi airline, Egypt airlines, Jordanian, Emirates, and the like, then they will tell you. They will tell you, like they says, look, for the hujjaj, they make announcement. They says, for the hujjaj who are going to make hajj or making umrah and uh, going directly to Mecca. Because if you go into Medina, it's okay. It's okay. Even if you land in Jeddah, but you're not going to Mecca, you go going to Medina, you stay in your clothing. No problem. But if person going straight to, to Mecca to make Umrah, then those people, they have to engage in a state of ihram in the plane. They don't wait until they arrive to Jeddah, land in Jeddah. So like I was saying, this, alhamdulillah, now those flight attendants, they say that. They make announcement. Sometimes the pilot himself does it. And he says for the hujjaj, Zakumullah khairan, taqabbalallahu minkum, may Allah accept from you. Inshallah, this is the captain talking, or this is the supervisor of the flight attendant talking, and the like. And they say, in half an hour from now, we're going to be on the miqat. Because they know. They says, and, and keep in mind, the, the plane fast. In one minute, they go miles. Who knows, maybe 100 miles or so, in a minute. So they said, they say, look, in half an hour, we're going to be on the miqat. So this way, those who are not, dressed already and took off their clothes, the men, not the women. The women, their, their clothing of ihram, they their regular ibayahs and clothing. The women don't go and take off again. No. Even though some women do that, but they shouldn't. Their regular clothing are the clothing of, of ihram. But the men, those who didn't do it, they will go and take care of so. And then alhamdulillah, they says, after half an hour, Sheikh al he says, look, if they say, if the captain says in half an hour from now we're going to be in the miqat, he says, you need to look at what time it is. If it was 3.30 at that time, at 4 o'clock, because the captain may forget. The captain, yes, he may say, look, at 4 o'clock he may say, and that's what they usually do, now we're on the miqat, so that the people do what at this time? Start changing? No, they say, La bayka Allah, not the intention. They say, La bayka Allahumma Umrah. La bayka Allahumma Hajj. That's not the intention. Okay? The intention is in the heart. So, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, he addressed this. That's a very important point. He says, once that flight attendant or the captain says, look, in half an hour, we're going to be on the miqat, he says, you need to know. Look at your clock. If it's 3.30, for example, 4 o'clock, you're going to be in the miqat. You know why? Because sometimes the captain may forget to make announcement. And you need to do what you got to do, okay? Anyway, so, ihram and miqat, from the miqat, and shaving the entire head, or three minutes, the entire head, are two wajibat. Two for both, umrah and hajj. So these are the two for umrah. Okay? And they are the two out of the seven from Hajj. Okay? So now we have to bring the other five remaining from Hajj. A thalit min wajibat al Hajj. The third one from the Hajj, now whatever we're going to take is only for Hajj, not Umrah. Al wuqufu bi arafa ila ghurub al shams liman waqafa biha naharan. To stay in Arafah, and that's on the 9th of the Hijjah, by the way, until sunset, for anyone who arrived there before sunset. Anyone who arrived in Arafah to Arafah in the daytime, it is obligatory upon them to stay there until sunset. 
don't leave Arafat before sunset. Even though some people, they just leave. You know, Asr, you see them leaving. Of course, keep in mind, Arafat is a huge place. Some people, so like this is a huge place. And some people, they're way in the east. Muzdalifa is to the west of Arafat. So some people, they weigh like two kilometers far in this way. So what those people do? Yes, they can start walking after Asr. If they are walking, they start walking. But if they make it to the borders of Arafah, and still sun didn't set, they should stop there and wait until the sun set. So we say this because sometimes people, they be like, look, are they living? They're not following the sunnah. We can't just jump in conclusion. No. These people, maybe they just trying to get closer to the border. And if they made it, because sometimes while they're walking, sunset come on them, they're still in the middle of Arafah. But sometimes people, they said, especially those who walk, they said, look, just let's get a head start. Okay? And then, inshallah, if the sunset find them in Arafat, it's okay to move in, uh, and, and, and to have a, a start moving before that. But remember, anyone who make it to Arafat before sunset, meaning in daytime, because some people, they get there in the morning, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11, 1, 2, 3, based on transportation. So those who made it there to Arafat in the daytime, it is obligatory upon them to stay until sunset. Li Jabir radiallahu anhu. Now, as for those people who they make it, to Arafah until after sunset, they don't have to stay there. Even if they just go around in it, they enter and go back, it's okay. Okay? Lihadith Jabir radiallahu anhu fi sifati hajjihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of this hadith, this is one of the main hadith, hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim. Because Jabir described in it the hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the entire hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, uh, just a portion of the hadith, it's not the entire hadith, the hadith is very long, it's a Muslim. قَالَ فَلَمْ يَزَلْ وَاقِبًا حَتَّى غَلَبَتِ الشَّمْسِ وَذَهَبَتِ الصُّفْرَ قَلِيلًا حَتَّى غَابَ الْقُرْسِ It's hadith number 2950, 2950, 2950 in Sahih Muslim. Jabir radiallahu anhu, who made the hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and observed what the Prophet was doing, he says, and he remained in Arafat until the sun has set. The whole course, the entire sun set, not just while sitting. The entire sun has set completely. وَقَدْ قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَمْ لِتَأْخُذُوا مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَإِنِّي لَا أَدْرِي لَا عَلِي لَا أَحُجُّ بَعْدَ حَجَّتِي هَذِهِ And the Prophet Sallallahu has said, Take from me, he said to the Sahaba, and all those who made hajj with him, and also, it is for us to take the manasik, the rights of hajj, how we perform hajj from him. The sahaba, they took it from him in person. We, we took it from his sunnah, alhamdulillah. Then the Prophet he said to them, I may not make hajj after this one. And that's what happened. The Prophet died after that. Okay? He died before the next hajj comes in. This hadith also is collected by Imam Muslim from Jabir radiallahu anhu. Al-Rabi' min wajibat al-Hajj al-Mabitu bi Muzdalifah. So now when you leave Arafah, you come to a place called Muzdalifah. Okay? There's no tents in there, no hotels, nothing. No restaurants. These bathrooms, alhamdulillah, and the floor, meaning dirt. That's it. So that's why they says bring a sleeping bag. That's what you need it for. And sometimes in Mina, it depends on the package that you have. But now most of the packages, they give you mattresses. But some of them still don't give you anything, so you need a sleeping bag, okay? Spending the night in place called Muzdalifa. This is a place called Muzdalifa. This is between Mina and Arafat. 
you pass it when you be going on the night when you're going from Mina to Arafat, you pass Muzdalifa. You will see if you pay attention, you will see the signs the same Muzdalifa and you will pass it. But on Arafat, on your way to Mina, you're gonna spend that night to Muzdali in Muzdalifa. Okay? هذا لقول الله عز وجل فإذا أفضت من عرفات فاذكروا الله عند المشهر الحرام because in the ayah 198 in surah al-Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and once you leave عرفات remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after عرفات remember Allah at the place called المشهر الحرام والمشهر الحرام مزدلفة that's Muzdalifa. Al-Mash'ar al-Haram is a Muzdalifa. قال ولأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بات بها حتى أصبح and also because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he spent the night in there until the morning. He spent the night until he prayed Fajr صلى الله عليه وسلم in Muzdalifa. ورخص للدعف من النساء والسبيان بالإفادة إلى منا في آخر الليل رواه البخاري ومسلم عن ابن عمر وعن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he gave permission for the weak amongst the women and children and the like to leave مزدلفة at the end of the night. Okay, towards the last part of the night. It's collected by Imam al-Bukhari or Muslim on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar and also ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhum. وَالتَّرْخِيصُ مِنْهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ لَهُمْ يَدُلُّ عَلَى وُجُوبِ الْمَبِيدِ لِأَنَّهُ لَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ وَاجِبَ لَمْ يُحْتَجْ فِيهِ لَتَّرْخِيصِ Now here is a fiqh from the shaykh. He says, since the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave permission to a specific people okay, to leave and not to spend the whole night in Muzdalifa, that shows, that's a dalil and a proof that it is obligatory to spend the night in Muzdalifa unless a person have that same valid reason. Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Ta'ala says, because if it's not the case, if spending the night in Muzdalifa was not obligatory, there is no need for the Prophet Wasallam to give these people permission to leave. Okay? So if you make Hajj, Yakhwan, because some people, they just see the people leaving and they're like, oh, let's go, that's enough, let's go. No, it's not. You can say it's enough, it comes to the Sunnah. If a person is sick or have an older family members with him, father, mother, his wife pregnant, has children, whatever the case is, himself, he is have conditions, he can leave. But somebody who is, alhamdulillah, you know, still strong, Alhamdulillah, okay, has nothing to do with the age. Some person maybe 60, 65, they still, Alhamdulillah, those people, they stay until uh, the morning, inshallah. Al-Khamis min wajibat al-Hajj, ramyu jamarat al-Aqaba yom al-Nahr qabla al-Zawali wa ba'dahu. The fifth from the obligatory elements of Hajj is the Throwing the pebbles at Jamrat al Aqaba, Yom al Nahar, and this on the 10th of the Hijjah. Before Zawal, before Dhuhr, or after Dhuhr, it's okay, it's all permissible. Warami al Jamarat al Talat fi Ayyam al Tashriq by the Zawal. Also, this point is, is about the throwing the pebbles in the Jamarat. Okay? Also, the, the three Jamarat, because there is three Jamarat. There is Al-Jamarat Sughra, Wal-Wusta, Wal-Kubra, Jamarat Al-Aqaba. They are in this one after the other. Okay? The Sughra, the small one, is the closest to Mina. Because you have Mecca in here, and you have Mina in here. And then you have Muzdalifa, and then you have Arafat. In this order. Haram, Mecca, and the Haram, Mina, Muzdalifa, Arafat. So when you come in from Mina to the Jamarat, the first one that you see an encounter is called Jamrat Sughra. 
the smallest one. On the tent of the Hijjah, you leave that alone. Alhamdulillah for the government of Saudi, they, they have the yellow tea. You know the yellow tea? Do not cross, or so do not enter. They have it around that, and they have soldiers in there. Alhamdulillah, they tell the people, leave. People still, I want to do it. They say, not today, tomorrow, inshallah. <laughs> Keep going. Alhamdulillah. Then as you're still going, you're going to see the middle one. That's why they call it Al-Aqab Al-Jamr Al-Wusta. That one too, on the tent of the Hijjah, you're going to see yellow tape around it. Meaning, don't do it. And still you're going to find soldiers in there, Zahamullah Khairan, tell the people, La Ya Hajji, keep going. And then, of course, you're going to see nobody. You're like, what's going on, man? Nobody's doing it. I'm alone, Allah. That's not done that day. Then you're going to see all the people right there. That's where the crowd is. That's called Jamrat Al-Aqaba. That's what you do on that day, on the 10th. But on the 11th and the 12th, everybody does the three of them. And that's from the Wajibat Al-Hajj. And if you do the 12th, on the 12th day, you throw the pebbles, you can leave if you want. But if you want to stay until the 13th, MashaAllah, yes you can, that's better. Hey. And this is because of the hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, who says, Rama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-jamrata yawm al-nahri duha, wa amma ba'du fa'idha zalat al-shams, rawaha Muslim. This hadith is correct by Muslim number 3141. Uh, he says, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam throw the jamrata, on the tent of the Hijjah, the day of the Eid, Doha, in the morning. Because that's when the Prophet Sallallahu he prayed Fajr in Muzdalifah, he made Dua, a long Dua, but before sunrise, then the Prophet Sallallahu left straight to this one, Jamrat al-Aqaba. So he got there in the morning, on Doha, still in the morning, before Zawal, before Dhuhr. He got there still in the morning, early morning after sunrise and then he throw the jamar al-aqaba as for the other days the 11 12 and 13 that is after zawal no throwing before zawal before dhuhr time but wait until dhuhr time is in that's when the time of the throwing of the jamarat in the 11 12 and the 13th Days uh, start. No. Hmm? Uh, the pebbles, there is no specific place to pick up the pebbles. You can pick them up in any place you want. Alhamdulillah. However, the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered Al Abbas or one of the companions to to collect some pebbles from him, for him, for that day, because only seven, uh, after he left Muzdalifah, going towards the Jamara. And therefore the ulama, they highlight, we're going to mention some of the mistakes and the akhta of, of the pilgrims, when they arrive in Muzdalifah, instead to pray and go to sleep, as this is the sunnah, uh, people, they, they start collecting hundreds of, of, of pebbles. Some people are creative, they bring with them little uh, hammers. And they come right, you sleep in and they bring a big rock. Ta, 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 ta. They break it into pieces. And all that stuff, that's not from the sunnah. You, you lay down and you sleep and you can get, alhamdulillah, the, uh, you can get those pebbles right in, in, in the tent. Your tent because most of the tents are, if it is rags. Most of them are, are red rags. And, and, if, and they are on sand. If you just pull that rag a little bit and start digging, you will see a lot of pebbles right there. I think they put it on purpose, Allah alam. That's why I mostly I get mine. They right there. People go and look. I don't know where. And look and they right there. You were laying on them. 
Yeah? yeah. Twice? I mean, seven pebbles. No, 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 two times. One on the Yom Nahar. The Yom Nahar, you do Jamrat al Aqaba alone with seven pebbles. Seven pebbles, that one by itself. On the 11th, you do all three of them. Each one seven. That's how many you need? 21. 21. Then the next day, what you do? All three of them. Each one is what? Seven, how many? 21. So 21 and 21, how much? 42. And seven? 49. 49. So those who's going to do only two days, along with the Eid, they need 49 pebbles. Those who are going to stay until the, the next day, and do it, how many they need? Seven for each one of them, and they are three? 21. 21 plus 49? Huh? 70. 70. Nah, that's what they need. I don't want to open that door of talking about the pebbles, people, they wash them in Zimzim and all that. Nah. Allah Musta. <clears throat> and people get big ones, man. If they hit somebody, they hurt them. Only pebbles, not the sandals or shoes. <laughs> yes, only pebbles. Now, nah. how about you stay in uh, huh? more days? You stay after the 13th. You stay in like Where? Days. in Mina. In Mina, mm-hmm. if somebody stays in Mina more than yeah. those three days, yeah. why would the person do that? Can they do that? No, 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 no. The Jamarats actually. The throwing of Jamarat, the the time stops at Maghrib on the 13th. The end of the 13th day, stop at Maghrib. Said no more. And that's the Sunnah. If somebody stays in Mina because they have nowhere to go, and they have like three, four days before they travel, and they got no place to go, and they allow them to stay there, that's all they do, stay, that's it. They sleep and eat and pray on time, and remember Allah. But they don't go to the Jamarat and throw Jamarat, no. Jamarat is only on the, the eighth day, only one Jamra, Jamarat al-Aqaba, and then on the 11th and the 12th, everybody does all of them, the small one, the middle one, and Jamarat al-Aqaba, on the, and then those who wants to leave Mina, they can. It's okay. But those who have nowhere, it's, they don't have no, it's not an emergency, it's not they have to leave, then it's better for them to stay. To stay in Mina and do the 13th day, inshallah, and by Maghrib they should be done, and say it, and, and leave Mina, inshallah. So which, is, which is obligatory? Huh? Which throwing is obligatory? All three of them. All of this that we mentioned, all of them are obligatory. All of them are obligatory, meaning everybody has to do it himself. And everybody has to do it each day. Okay? So on the Eid, Jamrat al-Aqaba is obligatory for you to do it. Unless if somebody is very sick, cannot go there, the ulama, they said that person can have somebody else to do it for him. So on the Eid, that person, somebody has a mother with him. She's very old. She got very sick. She can't even move. Or a pregnant wife, for example. What that person do? He brings seven, his, and seven for the person he's going to do it for. And he stands right there. He does his. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And then he takes the other seven for his mother, for example. On the three days... He will bring 21 for him and 21 for his mother, for example. And when he stands in the first one, he does it for him. And then he does, in his intention, he does the one for his mother. It's, it's not like meaning that he finish his and go around now. He does both him and his mother, then go to the middle one, then go to Alhamdulillah. Now, in the Shaykh, he mentioned that uh, the hadith of Asim ibn Adi, radiallahu anh, that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave permission to the shepherds 
the people they have they do want to take care of the animals okay the ru'at to spend the night and they will in Mina and they will throw the Jamrat al-Aqaba on the, the Yom al-Nahar they do that but then they can go and take care of the animals okay and they will throw two days at once instead of the rest of the people they have to come day by day every day do the Jamrat but for, for them the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi give them permission to skip one day and come the next day and do for the, the, the day and the day before it. So the Prophet, the Shaykh, he says, since the Prophet ﷺ given permission to delay the throwing, but he didn't tell them, oh, you're shepherds, you're exempt. See? He told them, okay, since you have things to do and you attend to the animals and this and that, taking care of those animals, then, okay, you don't do it tomorrow, wait until the next day, but you have to do both days. Okay, he said, if it's not obligatory, the Prophet ﷺ would not tell them you have to do it. Still, you have to, to make it up. السادس المبيت بمنا ليالي أيام التشريق الثلاث للمتأخرين وليلتين للمتعجلين The sixth from the obligatory pillars or, or uh, uh, obligatory elements الواجبات of Hajj spending the night in Mina the three nights of التشريق the 11th, the 12th and the 13th for those who wants to spend all of these three nights and two nights for those who wants to live on the 13th once they do the 11th and the 12th they leave before sunset. Okay? لِقَوْلِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلُ وَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامِ الْمَعْدُودَاتِ And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in well-known days. فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهُ وَمَنْ تَأَخَرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهُ لِمَنْ اتَّقَى آية 2 or 3 in Surah Al-Baqarah. So whoever wants to leave after two days, leave Mina after two days, after spending the 11th and the 12th, it's okay. Whoever wants to stay until the 13th, it's okay, inshallah. And also he says, because the Prophet ﷺ, he spent the night, this, all the three nights of Tashriq in Mina. Naam, this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he left Mina on the 13th day after he threw the Jamarat, all of them, the three Jamarats, after Zawal, meaning when Dhuhr time comes in. However, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave permission for those people who have valid reason to uh, not to spend the night in, in Mina. Like, for example, the, 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 the Ru'ad, the shepherds. And those people who used to carry water. Like Al-Abbas, radiallahu anhu, because he used to bring water to the people in Mina. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, give them permission to spend the night in Mecca because they have things to do. They, 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 they bring water. The Shaykh says the same thing. This, the other people, any people that they have a valid reason, okay, and they doing something that uh, not make it easy for them to be in Mina, they can spend the night outside Mina. For example, he says al junood Some soldiers, they make a hajj, but they were deployed outside Mina. For security reasons and this, those people, it's okay for them if they spend the night outside of Mina. Okay? Well, atibba wa nahwahum. Doctors, he says, and the like of them. The, 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 yes, there is hospitals in Mina, alhamdulillah. But there is other hospitals outside Mina. So Alhamdulillah, some, some doctors and nurses and the like, MashaAllah, they tell them, okay, you're going to be in this hospital in Mina. Alhamdulillah, they should thank Allah for that. Other ones, they have to be in other hospitals, they make in Hajj, it's permissible for them to spend the night where they are. They're not going to leave the patients and say, no, I'm going to go to Mina. Okay? As-sabi' tawaf al-wada' 
The seventh from the wajibat of al-hajj, the obligatory element of hajj, tawaf al-wada'. The farewell tawaf. Okay? This is the last thing that the person do before they leave Mecca. Because the Prophet ﷺ performed this tawaf al-wada upon leaving Mecca. And for, also for the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, قال أمر الناس أن يكون آخر عهد بالبيت إلا أنه خفف عن الحائد رواه البخاري مسلم. He says that the people they were commanded, of course, by the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, that the last thing they should do before leaving Mecca is طواف الوداع. طواف الوداع. And the, and the women on their menses they are exempt from this. If a woman in her mens and that's the only thing. She completes everything. She did tawaf al-wada, tawaf al-ifada, sa'i. She did everything. The only thing that is left for her is the farewell tawaf, tawaf al-wada. The man's in woman, she leaves. She doesn't have to wait until she's clean. Now she leaves. Okay? says, <laughs> The fact that the Prophet ﷺ gave permission for the men's and women to leave without performing the farewell tawaf, it shows that it's obligatory. It shows that because he gave them permission. Okay? It shows that it's obligatory for others who do not have per- a valid reason to perform tawaf al wada the farewell tawaf. He says the same ruling applies on the woman on their postnatal bleeding for those women who uh, uh, have babies and they still not pure and also because of the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma he says the people used to just leave once they finish has they everybody start leaving the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no one should leave mecca until the last thing he does is tawaf around the the house of Allah, Rawah Muslim. And also because of the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, we mentioned, the Shaykh mentioned it in, uh, previously in, uh, in uh, other classes, we mentioned that, that the Prophet ﷺ said about Safiya, his wife, one of his wives that was with him, uh, when he was told by Aisha that Safiya, she's on her menses, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ahabi Satunahi, are we going to wait for her until she's, her menses come to an end? Because the Prophet ﷺ thought that she didn't perform tawaf al-ifada, the tawaf of hajj. If a woman, during a musdalifa, for example, she has her menses, that woman do not make tawaf until she's the, 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 her cycle comes to an end and she take a ghusl, then make tawaf. But here Safiya radiallahu anha, she already made tawaf al-ifada because when the Prophet ﷺ heard about that, he says, are we going to wait for her? Aisha radiallahu anha, she said to the Prophet ﷺ, no, she's already made tawaf al-ifada on the day of the Eid, the day of Nahar. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, oh, khruju, let's go. So Safiya, she didn't, radiallahu anha, she didn't perform tawaf al-wada. Next, inshallah ta'ala, in next class, on, uh, we, we will go with, we continue, inshallah ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslimu kathira.